we're often told about God's grace, God's unconditional love, and how that love is powerful, how that love is, again, unconditional, how that love is life-giving, how that love is life-transforming, and how that love is freely given. And I think there's a tendency within human nature, or maybe it's just me, that when we are confronted with something so pure, with something so good, with something so life-giving and life-changing and powerful, such as unconditional love, we don't know what to do with it. So we, instead of embracing it, instead of living into it, instead of leaning into it, we tend to distort it, dismiss it, disguise it. And, 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 and therefore make it more sense to us. I mean, think about how the church has often distorted the message of God's love by, by putting rules and regulations of how to receive that love. You know, like you have to join this church and you have to be baptized by this church and then you have to do these things and before you do these things, you do not belong and when you do not belong, you are not loved. Or think about the ways that we... we uh, use the rules and regulations that we come up with to dismiss people from God's presence, to put further barriers between them and God. We tell them, no, the Bible says that your lifestyle is unacceptable to God, that it's an abomination of, of, the, spirit, of the Scripture, that, that the way, the, what you have done has excused you from the presence of God. We do so many things to dismiss, distort, discount God's love so that it makes sense to us. And the craziest thing is, while we talk about God's mercy and God's grace and God's love, we usually want that, reserve that for ourselves. Mercy for me, justice for thee, right? When we mess up, it's God, I want your mercy. Please forgive me, love me. And when they mess up, it's like, yeah, see, this is why God hates you. This is why, God, go get them. God, strike lightning on them. We're constantly putting up barriers between people and God's love. And I think that's why there's a reputation that God is angry, that God is vengeful, that God is out to get us, that God wants to punish us. And I was, as, as I was thinking about this passage that we read from Romans, I kept going back to the story of Adam and Eve. I have no idea why. Well, actually, I do have an idea why. See, we often remember Adam and Eve messing up. They ate the fruit. We say it's an apple, but the Bible never says it's an apple, but they ate the fruit and they get kicked out of the garden. And the story is often called the fall of man. And, and some of us might remember that before they were kicked out, that they were given a curse. God said that Adam will uh, have to struggle to till the ground. God said that Eve will have to struggle when, when giving birth, that, that labor is going to be painful. And then for those of us who grew up in Sunday school all their life, we're often left with this final image of the story of Garden of Eden, and that's God sending winged creatures or angels with, with uh, swords of flames and they are guarding the entrances or the entrance of the Garden of Eden so that no one can find it and no one can enter it again, especially Adam and Eve. So in that image, in that sense, yes, it's easy to understand why we might, we, people may view God as this angry God, as this God who is out to punish us, because in the story of Adam and Eve, there's punishment and there is banishment. But again, like I said, it kind of feels right. There is justice to it. There is someone did something wrong, and because it wasn't me, I want justice to take place. But what gets ignored in our telling and discussing the story about Adam and Eve is the tenderness of God. See, Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They knew, they knew that they messed up. And as they were panicking because they knew that they did wrong, they hear God walking through the garden. God is walking. God has legs. I don't know how to picture God with legs. Actually, I don't know how to picture God in general. 
And as they hear God walking through the garden, they, they start to become, they start to really panic. And, and they're ashamed because not only did they break the one rule that God gave them, like they had one job really, and that was not to eat this fruit. And they did. But not only did they screw up, they, they're naked. And they're ashamed that they're naked. So they went and they hid. And God asked, where are you? Now, I know this is common sense. I know this is obvious. But when you ask someone, where are you? It's usually because you're genuinely curious to know where they're at. You don't ask someone, where are you? If you have no intentions of un understanding where they're at or if you have no intentions of finding them. God asks, where are you? Because he wants to know where Adam and Eve are at. And while we may focus too much on the punishment God lays out, we don't discuss enough what God actually does next. The Lord God, the Bible says, the Lord God made the man and his wife leather clothes and dressed them. I don't know, have you ever been so upset with someone that you take the time to make, some, make them something nice, to make them something that they need? Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that to me. I can't believe you hurt me that much. To tell you how much you hurt me, I'm going to make you a nice pair of shoes. No. God sacrificed a cow to make leather clothes. It wasn't just some kind of trees and figs and leaves that he put together. God took time to skin a cow's hide, to kill a cow and skin the cow to make Adam and Eve leather clothes and maybe it's me but but that doesn't sound like them being punished that doesn't sound like god is wanting to punish them it sounds like someone who is who deeply loves adam and eve it sounds like someone who's, who might be a little bit hurt by what adam and eve have done but doesn't love them any less see the thing is our actions have consequences. What Adam and Eve did have consequences. And, the, and, those consequ and that consequence was for them to not be able to live in the Garden of Eden. That didn't mean that God loved them any less. It's just that their actions had consequences. We, we Americans, especially in this time, we love to tout freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of this, freedom of that. But you know, with that freedom also comes consequences if we say something horrible because of our freedom of speech we can also be punished and 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 be held accountable to the horrible things that we say freedom of speech and freedom of whatever isn't freedom of consequences adam and eve they just couldn't stay in the garden anymore because of what they had done but again that didn't mean that god loved them any less because god didn't want to want them to leave even more ashamed and even more embarrassed god didn't want them to leave being naked god made them close leather close at that to send them on their way and from that moment god has always been reaching out to humanity. God has always been asking, where are you? Because God wants to find you. God has been relentless, relentlessly searching for you and pursuing you. See, this God, this God that I believe in is not a passive God, but it's almost like an aggressive God. It's as if God wants to make you feel God's love. And because this love is so profound and so transforming and so unconditional, we might feel the need to put barriers between us and God's love. We might put barriers saying that, no, 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 we're not good enough, we're not worthy enough, I'm not good enough, I've done this and I don't deserve that, so I don't, I, because I've done this, I don't deserve God's love. Or, or we might have others, like the church, put barriers between people and God's love, trying to limit how much God loves you or trying to tell you that God doesn't love you because 
of so-and-so. But let's revisit Paul's words again from today. He says, who will separate us from Christ's love? Will we, be, will we be separated by trouble or distress or harassment or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And then he says, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord, not death or life, not angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth, or any other thing that is created. There are not that many truths that I will stand in front of you and proclaim, but this one is, certain, is, is I'm certain is truth. And that is, God loves you. There is absolutely nothing that you can do about it. God loves you regardless. No ifs, ands, or buts. You are loved. Period. So be reminded. Be reminded today. Be reminded tomorrow. Be reminded for every day of your life of this love, of God's love that pursues you. Let yourself be caught up in being God's beloved. You are God's child, whom God dearly loves and whom God finds happiness in. If there's nothing that you remember from today or from our time together, there's, only, there's one thing that I hope you remember, and that is you are loved that there's nothing that you can do to separate you from God's love, that there's nothing that others can do, there's nothing that others can say, that there's nothing in this world and in this universe that can separate you from the love of God. You are love, and you matter deeply to God.